Thanks so much again for joining us for our final webinar in our student success series, uh, where today we're going to be going over stress management. Uh, we've all learned the hard way that life can get a little bit stressful sometimes, especially when you're dealing with school, work, raising families, and just about everything else that can get thrown your way. But today we're hoping to help out with that. I'm joined by our wonderful presenters, Dr. Amy Dietzman and Jessica Rothheiser from our training and development team. And they're gonna walk you through how to identify your stress and even work with it. So without further ado, I'll pass it on over to them. Awesome, thank you, Maxine. This is Amy and I'm gonna get us started today. So today we're gonna to talk about how to manage the inevitable stress that comes with being a student and all the other things that you might be doing in your life. We're also gonna talk about how to view stress as a positive and how to prevent some stress in your everyday activities. Jess and I are not psychologists. We do not have degrees in psychology, but we are able to share with you some tips and tricks we've learned along the way and a lot of the latest research on stress. Keep in mind that we are not addressing anxiety and depression here today. For more help with these conditions, it's best to talk to a healthcare or mental health care provider. Just wanna give that um, up front. But let me tell you a little bit about my own experience. I went to college right out of high school. I worked full time during most of my studies, but I was young and I managed. Later on in life, after marriage and with two small children, I went back to school got my master's degree and then my doctorate. All the while I was working full time, taking care of preschool and elementary school age children. And I had a husband. In fact, while working on my doctorate, I changed jobs twice. So I can talk to you about stress. So hopefully I can share some tips and tricks. Let's start by defining stress management. It is a set of techniques and programs intended to help people deal more effectively with stress in their lives by analyzing the specific stressors and taking positive actions to minimize their effects. So I highlighted a couple things here. Deal more effectively, analyzing specific stressors. And we also need to take positive actions. So we need to deal more effectively. And let's just talk a little bit about how we do all these things. First, let's talk about the different kinds of stress. Not all stress is equal. I always thought stress was bad, but stress that we feel when we get excited and when there isn't a threat or fear is actually good stress. It keeps us feeling alive. If you've set an achievable and motivating goal, then the pressure you put on yourself to reach that goal is actually good. Bad stress is acute stress. It comes from quick surprises that need a response. Acute stress triggers the body's stress response, but the triggers aren't always so happy and exciting. Acute stress in itself does not take a heavy toll if we are able to relax quickly afterwards. Once the stressor has been dealt with, we have to return our body to homeostasis or pre-stress state to be healthy and happy. So an example of acute stress is a job interview. You get really nervous, you feel stressed, you do it and you come back down or something like when you get a speeding ticket. Chronic stress is another form of bad stress and it's the worst. It's the kind of stress that ages us. It occurs when we repeatedly face stressors that take a heavy toll and feel inescapable. This could be a stressful job, an unhappy home life. These things can cause chronic stress. And this is what we normally think of as serious stress because our bodies aren't designed for chronic stress. We can face negative health effects, both physical and emotional, if we deal with chronic stress for an extended period of time. And lastly, believe it or not, those who are adrenaline junkies are actually putting their bodies through too much stress. So that's not a good thing. In this picture, the roller coaster for most of us is a good stress because it's invigorating, our hearts race, and we do feel alive afterward. So how do you make bad stress good? 
Well, first off, you need to understand a growth mindset. A growth mindset is one that realizes we are all growing and learning. And in order to grow, going to be uncomfortable. It might be hard. We might fail along the way, but we have to persist and we have to know that our efforts will pay off. Making bad stress good also means that we will know when we need to use our resources to help relieve the stress. And we're gonna talk more about resources in a few minutes. When we can see the benefits of stress, it helps us to make it good. Just like I said that good stress is when we can tie it to goals. If we know the stress is temporary, we know that at the end of it, we're gonna have a degree or we're gonna have a certificate that's going to help us change how we think about it. We also need to recognize our stresses, our strengths and abilities. We have to believe that we can get through it and come out successful. And some students see stress and pressure as paralyzing, and this leads to procrastination. But it's all about the, the mindset. Pressure can lead to productivity. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this too. And see threats as challenges. If you signed up for school, if you decided you want a degree to further your career or to help you get a new foot in a new industry, whatever it might be, you already did the first thing. You said, challenge accepted. Did you know that believing stress is bad for you and stressing out about the stress is actually worse than the stress itself? Now, if this doesn't tell you that it's all about your mindset and how you approach and think about stress, then I don't know what does it. But have you ever had trouble sleeping? And all you can think is, oh, if I could just fall asleep right now, I'll still get five hours of sleep. Five hours is enough. I can go on five hours. And then a little bit later, you're like, oh, if I can just fall asleep right now, I'll get four hours of sleep. All right, four hours isn't great, but I can get by. The next thing you know, you're stressing yourself out and you're not falling asleep. The same concept applies here. It's all about how we think about stress and what we believe about stress. There are researchers out there who say, we need to make stress our friend. How do we do that? Well, it's not easy, but we start by thinking, how is this stress gonna help me reach my goal? When we get anxious, we tend to focus on the negative. So it's a mind shift. We can do this by envisioning what it looks like when that stress subsides. How is your life different? Are you closer to your goal? Are you in a new job? Have you finished with a big project at work and you feel like you've made a difference? Are you living in a new house? What's the means to the end? Then look at the stress as just part of the process. I'm gonna feel stressed out right now. I'm going to feel it, but it's gonna get me where I'm going. Now stress becomes your friend. When you're feeling stressed, you need to know what resources are available to you and how you can use those tools. So for financial stress, obviously your best resource is your school financial advisor. It's okay to call this person and ask them to talk you through it, like what's on the bill or what do I need to do next? Or I don't understand this question on the FAFSA. Call your student success advisor or any advisor that you might have. You may not be called a student success advisor where you go to school, but Call that person and ask questions. Tell them, you know, I'm stressing out about this. Their job is to support you. And too many students don't actually talk to their instructors. Sometimes college professors are intimidating, but they are just people and they will care enough to help you. Librarians and resource centers are totally underutilized. They have a wealth of knowledge. If you're stressing out about a paper or an assignment, the librarians at your school will jump at the chance to help you find the resources you need. Online libraries have come a long way in the past 10 years. Live chats, an abundance of digital resources, 24 seven hours, writing centers. These are just a few of the things that you might find if you just log into your library. And make sure that you save that page so you can easily find it the next time. Also reach out to parents or coworkers when you're stressed out and vent. Venting helps you to take a deep breath and release it. It also helps you to put things into perspective. Also, if you're in this webinar, you might have access to a tutor.com tutor through your school, your employer, 
the military, or your local library. Tutors are an excellent resource for stress management to help you talk through what it is that's stressing you out or just break something down in an assignment to make it more manageable or understandable. And we offer online tutoring options for all kinds of academic and student success topics. We even have tutors who can work with you one-on-one -on -one in some of the topics that we are discussing in this series and even today. And lastly, if you don't have a mentor or a really good friend who has maybe been where you are, you should try to find someone who knows exactly how you feel and who can give you advice from time to time. The fact is, as a student, you are not alone. To relieve your stress, you have to use these resources. Listen to those you trust and know your limits. If people start saying things to you like, I'm worried about you, that's a sign that you're experiencing bad stress and you might need a break. You might need to reach out to your college or your university and ask them what options you have. But also know the difference between the normal stress that comes from being busy when you need a long weekend off, maybe a vacation, and the kind of stress that is chronic and bad for your health. I've seen a lot of students who convince themselves they can't handle the stress and they need to take a semester off, which is perfectly acceptable. But a lot of those students often struggle to come back. So know your limits, know the sacrifices that you've decided you're gonna make. Know when you need to make a real change and make sure you know all of your options. Can you cut back on your hours at work? Maybe can you change your hours at work? Can you give something else up for a while? Can you get help from your parents? And if you're not sure, then go back to my last slide. Use your resources and ask someone to help you think through all the choices you have. TLC, and in this case, it means talk, look, and change. Remember how I said venting helps. Vent to someone, talk to your friend. Then look for the silver lining. No matter how bad things are, well, there's always a way it could be worse. There's always a silver lining. And then change the channel, which means find a positive distraction, such as taking a walk or going out for dinner. In order for this to work, you have to vent and then let it go. Change the channel. Don't keep venting over and over again. So I have a really good friend who loves to talk on the phone, and she loves to vent to all of her friends. The only problem is she prolongs the changing of the channel because she lives in this constant cycle of venting and talking for too long. She wants to tell everybody the story and she does it over and over again. So she doesn't get past that talk part. Don't be that person. And people who deal with stress the best know how to view it as temporary, as a positive, and those people are resilient. After the stress is over, they know how to reset and move on. Do you know how to do this? Maybe you've had a particularly stressful semester. You took some really hard classes. You were in the middle of an audit at your job. You've had sick kids. It's been stressful, but the semester's over. You've got a week off. How do you hit reset and get a refresh before the next one? Well, maybe one of these activities can help or at least get you to start thinking. Maybe you can take a day to yourself, take a drive to the beach or a lake or the mountains, depending on where you live. Maybe go for a long hike just by yourself. Maybe you just take a really long nap or a couple of long naps over the weekend. Maybe you go visit a friend or you go visit your parents, somebody who's going to pamper you a little bit. Maybe you go to the spa or you get a massage. Maybe you can purchase an unlimited yoga package and or you find a yoga program that you can do online. So I have had many stressful weeks where I, the weekend comes around and I feel exhausted and I have to give myself permission to rest because I'm a doer. I want to go, 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 go. And I feel lazy if I'm not constantly doing something. So I have to tell myself, you need to relax, Amy, and take a long nap. Sometimes I do that, and then I spend an entire afternoon painting, and I reset so that when I go back to work on Monday, I feel refreshed. Now, I have friends 
who schedule their weekends, their weeknights, every waking moment with go, go, go. Lots of scheduling. I'm not really a scheduling kind of person. I just like to do a lot of stuff. But I have friends who schedule everything. When life is stressful for them, how do they reset? How do they give themselves a chance to just relax? Ask yourself, do you know how to do this? To be proactive about your stress, to reduce it, and even to prevent it, consider these practices. Time and attention management helps to reduce your stress. The more you plan ahead, make a schedule, and keep yourself from procrastinating, the less stress you will feel. This was our first webinar earlier this month. So if you missed it, you're going to be able to find it on our YouTube page. We'll talk about that at the end. Exercise will help you in every stage of stress. Scheduled relaxation periods reduce stress. And the word here that I want you to hear me say is scheduled. There is something about knowing that you're going to get a break. And there's something about doing it regularly that helps you to feel less stress. Healthy diet. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this because you've probably all heard what bad foods do to your body, but proper diet can counterbalance the impact of stress by strengthening your immune system, stabilizing your moods, and reducing your blood pressure. Organization. The more organized you are in your workspace, your home, your study space, the less stressed and scattered you will feel. Remember that the more things we have going on in our lives, the more stuff we have to keep track of. So if we keep it organized, it's helpful. Now, I love British cooking competition shows. And I was watching one recently where one of the judges kept telling the contestants, clean up your workspace as they were cooking. She kept telling them that a messy kitchen is too distracting and it was a detriment to their focus. And she was right. You could literally watch how the messy ones couldn't find the right spatula or they kept forgetting things that were cooking and things were burning. Everything was a mess. And it reminded me of this topic. The messier and more disorganized you are, the more scattered and stressed and forgetful you will feel. Limited decision making is another topic that we've discussed before in this series. Make big decisions early in the day and take all the little stressful decisions that come up throughout your day out of the equation by sticking to a routine as much as you can. I know a lot of people think that sounds awfully boring. Routine, routine, routine. Boring, boring, boring. But it's one thing to do this for your life. It's another thing to just do it while you're in school. So let's talk a little bit more about each one of these. There is a reason why we did that time and attention management webinar first, because it is critical to your success as a student. Even if you have a busy life and a lot to do, you will feel differently about it if you know how to manage your time. You will be able to focus on what you need to focus on when you need to focus on it. When you know that you have time to do all those other things ahead of you, you've planned for them. You'll get to them. You know you will. So write things down. Stick to a schedule. This is why making lists is so important. Some days I wake up and I think I have way too much to do today. So I make a list. Just writing it down takes some of the pressure off me. And then seeing it written down and knowing that I'm just going to go through and check each thing off helps me turn my stressed feeling into productivity. And it also helps me not to procrastinate because I know I'm going to go through my list and check it off. Discipline also relieves stress. You're not feeling bad about putting things off and making it more stressful for yourself. Sometimes it also helps us to put it into perspective. Have you ever thought you had like 25 things to do in a day and you're feeling stressed and then you make a list and you realize there's only four things on your list? I have. Suddenly I realize, oh, okay, this is manageable. I'm going to get this done. And let's talk about organization. Does your desk look like this, guys? Well, I really hope not because this is not a productive workspace. Some people think that a messy desk makes them look busier. Some people do it on purpose. But it actually tells me that this guy is completely disorganized. He has probably forgotten about what he was supposed to do with all the things in the bottom of that stack. And if I were to ask him to find something, he's going to waste half the day looking for it. Chaos, disorder, 
and the unknown lead to stress. When you start a new class, get a simple two pocket folder. Keep anything you need to print out in your folder. On your computer, make a new folder for all the documents that you're going to produce and save them all in that one folder. And when you're done with that class, file away those folders and start new ones. Don't keep old documents, old syllabi, where they're cluttering up your workspaces. And for, a more, or, for more organization in your classes, I'm gonna pass it over to Jess now. All right, thanks, Amy. So one way you can get organized is by looking at an entire class beginning and laying out a plan to tackle it. So here's a course schedule for a class that Amy teaches. Uh, many professors will include something like this in their syllabus. So we suggest that you print this out, put it into that folder that Amy just told you to create, or if you're more of a digital person, save that to your desktop folder that you just created. And then you'll wanna add each due date to your calendar. Figure out how you're going to break up these assignments. So meaning this, the DUE date is not the DO date, right? The due date is not the do it date. <laughs> it's not the day you wanna start your assignment. So it's going to lead to stress because all week you'll be wondering, will I have enough time on Sunday to finish this paper? How big is this paper? How long is it going to take me? And you may not identify it as this, but you are causing yourself undue stress and anxiety. So instead, schedule days throughout the week, or if it's a really big assignment throughout the month, to work on chunks of the assignment. Again, if you're more of a digital person, another thing you can do with your syllabus is create a spreadsheet at the beginning of the semester with all of your assignments, quizzes, exams. You can enter the due dates and due uh, do times <laughs> and then color code the spreadsheet by course or by type of assignment, whatever works for you. And then you can sort that sheet by the due date. So you have a list in order of all of the things that you need to complete. And you have your whole semester's worth of work mapped out for you. And then as you complete an assignment, you can, if you want, delete it from the spreadsheet. You can cross it off like it is in this picture or you can even create a checkbox column to mark it as complete as well. So using stress for productivity is kind of a life hack. <laughs> so rather than letting an impending due date paralyze you, if you lay out your plan, make your list, add your work days to your calendar, and then just go and just do it, you can actually utilize the adrenaline that you feel when you have a big assignment to do. And that will boost you and give you the energy and focus that you need. So remember, as Amy said, it's all about how you think about it. So you can change how you respond, both mentally and physically, by changing how you're thinking about it. And so we already talked about, you know, making a list, feeling better about your day because there are no more unknowns. You see something on your list, you know you'll get to it, and then you can focus on one thing at a time. And so the same concept goes with compartmentalizing in your life. So Amy mentioned that she worked and had school and had kids all at the same time. I do not have the same experience, so I'm going to share a story from Amy. So Amy used to do her schoolwork in the morning. So then she was able to let it go throughout the day and do all the things that she needed to do, like her full-time job and focusing on her kids. So compartmentalizing different sections or different times throughout your day to work on different things could be a positive solution for you as well. In addition, you'll wanna make sure to focus only on what you can control. So it's true that we all get stressed about things we have no control over, and that eats up energy we probably don't have. That happens to me almost every single day I think about you know one thing that I have to do and I'm like well what's going to happen after I do that is it going to is this going to happen or is that going to happen and then what do I do and you know that's all out of my control I just need to do one thing and then see where where life is going to take me after that focus only on what I can control in the moment and then face the next thing when it comes around And exercise. Exercise is probably the number one way to be proactive about stress. 
So exercise releases endorphins, it acts as a natural painkiller, and it helps you sleep better. So all of these things can help relieve and prevent your stress. So when I feel myself getting overwhelmed or stressed about a task or going down that rabbit hole of, like I just said, what's going to happen next? I step away from it and I just go for a walk. Sometimes if I can't figure out how to deal with the problem in the moment, the solution might come to me while I'm out for my walk. Other times, it's just great to get some fresh air and let my mind wander. So when I say exercise, I don't want you to think you need to be training for an Ironman or anything like that. But just getting out for a walk, getting your heart rate up a little bit, doing exercise or movement that you love doing will help you see the most positive effects on your mental state. And routines. You know, Amy mentioned we may not always love routines, but routines help us relieve stress because less decisions have to be made in our day. So Amy mentioned this before, but I think it's worth mentioning again, the less that you leave to be decided when you get tired, the less stress you'll feel overall. So if you can maintain your routines from day to day, they'll become like clockwork and you'll remove so many decisions from your life. And unplug. This is a big way to get rid of stress. It's just turn off all of the noise in your life. And that includes your cell phone. You know, cell phones are constantly alerting us of everything that's going on, good and bad. Some days it seems like more bad than good. And this just contributes to our stress by adding things that we need to respond to or do for someone else. Sometimes we just need to shut it off to be able to take a deep breath. Be aware and recognize your stress strategies and if they're bad habits, work on changing those. So these can be behaviors that you've learned over years and sometimes they aren't the healthiest option. For example, some people cope with stress by self-medicating with unhealthy things. So you'll wanna identify what you do when you feel stressed and determine if there's something that you can do for yourself that is better. So I'm not telling you to get rid of all bad habits all at once, but start with one. Just exchange one bad habit for something better for you and see the positive effects that that can have on your mental state. And this is a big one, knowing when to say no. When you're a student, you're going to have to limit some of the things that you used to say yes to. For example, maybe volunteering or hosting birthday parties or holidays at your house, planning a family reunion, these things can be stressful. So it's okay to prioritize finishing school. Maybe you're the kind of person that's going to feel guilty over not doing those extra things, but remember that you can always get back into those things once you finish school. And you can still be present for your loved ones without adding extra stress to your life. So knowing when to say no is big, but also knowing how to say no. Sometimes we're afraid to say no out of fear that we may come across as rude. Um, so if saying no is hard for you, try making your default response, let me get back to you. Try a phrase like, let me check my schedule and get back to you later. Or good suggestion, let me think on it a little bit and get back to you. These are easy phrases that can extend your no. So they can buy you some time to rehearse your no. So if you're not good at saying no, practice. You can practice in front of a mirror, maybe get a friend or a family member to do some role playing with you so that you know once the time that you've bought yourself by saying later has run out, you'll be ready to give your no. So when you do say no, sometimes offering an explanation or an excuse as to why you're saying no may not be the best way to go. So consider a situation where someone asks you out on a date. You don't really want to go out with this person. So you say, I'm sorry, I have plans that day. What happens next? Well, they'll ask you what day works best for you. Or, you know, maybe you have a situation where someone asks you for help on a project and you say, I'm sorry, I don't have time because I'm working towards a major deadline. 
Well, they may come back with, oh, well, you know, it's a long project. I'd love to have your help when, when you're finished with yours. So by sometimes by offering an explanation or an excuse that's more specific, you might be leaving the door open for the other person to keep trying to get you to say yes. So now this doesn't mean that you need to be overly blunt with your nose. Uh, but for example, in that second example where someone's asked you for help on a project, you could say something like, I appreciate that you thought of me, but I do not have the bandwidth to take this on. And then you can wish them luck on the project, knowing that they won't ask you for help again. <laughs> so this isn't too harsh or rude, but it clearly communicates a no and it closes the door so you don't have to keep saying no to the same request. You could also try offering an alternative in place of an explanation. So for example, maybe someone invites you to a concert, but the tickets are just not in your budget. You could say no to the concert, but ask if the person wants to have a movie night or grab a coffee with you soon. And of course, don't forget about your body language. So according to Darioli and Mast, about 65 to 90% of our communication is nonverbal. So make sure that if you're saying no, your body is also saying no. And some ways you can do this would be you know, slightly turning your torso or your toes away from the person, or maybe even crossing your arms. All right, so if you like this sort of thing, you want a little extra help or reminders for stress management, there are a lot of apps that are out there that are great for forcing you to breathe, take a break, talk to yourself, identify how you're feeling. So there's Personal Zen. That app is specifically for stress management and anxiety and also has games that you can play to relieve stress. Uh, Happify is going to have you check in on yourself, identify your feelings, and provide games and activities you can do to help you work through those feelings. It also has discussion forums, expert tips, and articles. Uh, San Velo provides meditation exercises, and similarly, similarly, the Insight Timer helps you take a few minutes out of your day to meditate and breathe. And then I included Spotify here. Spotify has some great playlists for relaxation or studying. They even have a playlist to make you feel happy. So music is always a, a great way to kind of make yourself feel happier or match the mood that you're in. <laughs> and on the note of happiness, a good laugh also has short-term and long-term effects. So when you start to laugh, it doesn't just lighten your load mentally, it actually induces physical changes in your body as well. So laughter stimulates your heart, lungs, muscles, and it increases the endorphins that are released by your brain. So laughter also activates and relieves your stress response and can stimulate circulation, aid muscle, relax, muscle relaxation, both of which can help reduce some of the physical symptoms of stress. And in the long term, laughter counteracts negative feelings that you get when you're stressed that decrease your immunity. That also increases personal satisfaction and can improve your mood. So we talked about learning when and how to say no to stressful things, but make sure that you do leave room for things in your life that bring you joy. So spending time with friends that make you laugh or maybe going to an open mic comedy night can help you come home feeling refreshed and relaxed, and it can be something to look forward to. So if you have a friend or a loved one who makes you laugh, make sure to leave time to spend with them or watch a funny movie, read a funny book, just find a way to step away from your stress and have a good laugh if you can. So to recap, here are the 10 main things we talked about today. So with stress management, the first step is changing how you think about it and then making sure that you're utilizing your resources. From there, work on managing time effectively, getting organized, trying to use your stress as a tool for productivity, being present, changing bad habits, setting your limits, like saying no, <laughs> maintaining your routines and just exercising 
and laughing if you can. And so with that, I will pass it back to Maxine for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, as you can see, there are some references over here. Um, these will also be included in that follow-up email. And I did just want to remind folks, since there was a question that came in, uh, if you weren't able to stay for the entire time or if you have to hop off now, but you do want to uh, get some of the information that we're going to talk about through the Q&A at the very end, uh, don't worry. There will be a recording that is sent out in the next couple of days that has all of this information. Additionally, uh, as you can see on your screen right now, these are our socials. I highly, highly recommend that you follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, and head to our YouTube channel, which is where we have all of our previous recordings. This way, anytime we have a new webinar series that's coming up, you'll be able to get all of that information as soon as we put it out there. So again, I highly recommend following us on our socials. Now, the first question is for Jessica, um, and it was about the apps that you showed off a little bit earlier. Are all of those apps free to use? That is a great question. Um, and off the well, top of my head, I believe that they are all free to download. And then some of them may have yeah. additional in-app purchases or like Spotify, you know, there's a free version, but then also you don't want ads, you know, premium versions. But I do believe that they are partially, you know, every app is partially free. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I looked at those. The last time I looked at those, I was able to download all of them and do some of it a good amount of stuff on each one for free. Okay, awesome. So yeah, then people can definitely hop on into those apps and give them a try if, uh, if any of them sounded interesting. Now, um, one question came up and it's interesting to see how some of these might tie into previous webinar topics we've done over the past couple of years. But one, uh, one question was, do you have any tips for folks who are getting stressed because they aren't reaching the goals or deadlines that they themselves have set? Ooh, that's good. That's a good one. And we, we have done a goal setting webinar, which we did not do this winter, uh, but we've done it in the past. So if you're interested in the goals, I definitely recommend checking out the YouTube channel to see if you can, can learn a little bit more about how to set goals. But sure, we all do this. We all uh, set goals and then start to see that we're not getting there and we get stressed out, which is when we need to stop and reevaluate. It's always okay to reevaluate and reset a goal, but then there might be other things that you're doing that are getting in the way of that goal. Maybe you really aren't prioritizing uh, the things that are important to help you get there. So maybe you need to do like a, like a check on your priorities. And that kind of goes into what we talked today about, you know, using your resources and seeing if maybe there's something that needs to shift in your, in your life to make that goal actually happen for you. And also, you know, goals need to be realistic. Sometimes we set goals and we we want to push ourselves, but we set a, an unrealistic goal that's impossible to reach. And we don't want to do that because then that's that's just setting you up for failure. So that's another thing you want to look at. Is your goal actually a smart goal? Is it something that is specific and realistic that you can actually accomplish? And then the only other thing I can say about setting goals is that, um, you know, perhaps there's some uh, routines that you need to get into, some bad habits that you need to, to stop in order to reach that goal. And those, it's hard. It's hard for everyone. So make sure that you're kind of uh, really being honest with yourself about why you aren't getting there. And I don't know, Jess, do you have anything else to say about that? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I, I think also just show yourself some grace. You know, sometimes mm. life gets in the way of goals and sometimes there are, are more important things going on. Sure. And so, yeah, just showing yourself a little bit of of grace and and love <laughs> and allowing yourself some some mm -hmm. flexibility on your goal. It's OK if it takes you longer to get there. That's a good one. That's good, Jess. Awesome. Another question came in um, and it was about uh, how to say no to people. So I know in 
that portion of the webinar, there were a lot of kind of more personal experiences uh, that were talked about, but do you have any advice for how to say no at your job when you're at capacity or max bandwidth, especially when talking to your boss? Sure, yeah, this is a good, that's a good question. One of the things we've said in the past is, is to help ask your boss to help you set priorities. So if your boss is asking you to do something and you are like, oh my gosh, I cannot get that done. I'm in school and I have so many um, uh, other priorities and I'm working on so many projects and I'm at my, at my limit. What you might do is say to your boss, this is what I've got on my plate and I want to be able to do this other thing that you're giving me. Can you help me figure out where that should go in my list of priorities? Is this oh, is this something that I should do instead of doing one of these other things or before doing one of these other things? And your boss more than likely is going to say, oh, well, okay, I didn't realize you had all those things. Or yes, actually, this is more important. I'd rather you do this first and then do these things and just help take some of the pressure off. I think a lot of times what we do is we try to just always say yes and and we don't tell our boss that we're overwhelmed or we have too much going on or or you know we're falling behind we don't want to tell our boss that and then that's setting you up for failure also because eventually your boss is going to realize it so i think one of the best things to do is just to be honest ask for some help and say you know i want to do this not uh i don't want to do that or i don't have time to do that you don't want to talk like that to your boss but it's definitely okay to say how can you how can i do this can you help me Jess, do you have anything else to say about that? Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Actually, Amy is my boss <laughs> over the past <laughs> week or two. Um, you know, I was like, I'm, you know, feeling a little overwhelmed with everything I have going on. And and I didn't end up having to say no to anything. But she was like, let me know if there's anything I can take off your plate. And so your boss is going to be supportive. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully. Just, Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Just I would echo everything that Amy said. All right. We do have one more question coming in, and it's about counterproductive habits and how to best redirect them so that your unhealthy habit can become something that is a little bit healthier. Mm. It's great. Okay. So this is a story I've told before. One way to reset a habit is to, um, to get into a, a strict routine where you have a trigger. So my best example is this. Let's say most nights you finish dinner and you go and play video games. That's your thing. And you play video games and then you think to yourself, well, eventually after this game, I'm going to go do my homework or I'm going to finish this paper. And you don't because the video game gets really good. And the next thing you know, it's midnight. And now you're tired, right? So what you can do is set that trigger and that trigger might be the dinner. So you have dinner and then you want to have a couple of steps to get you to the right place. So what I would do is finish dinner. I clean up the kitchen. I'm going to make myself a cup of tea and then I'm going to walk into my study space. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to start doing my schoolwork and I'm going to have a schedule for exactly what's what amount of schoolwork I'm going to get done every night. So I have a stopping point for myself. I know that when I write my introduction to this paper and complete this math assignment, then that's it for that night. Now I can go play my video games because I've done my work. So the next night you do the same thing. You finish dinner, you clean up the kitchen, you make yourself a cup of tea. Now you're transitioning. You walk into the room where you do your studying, you sit down, and you do whatever it is you've scheduled for yourself to do that night. You keep doing it like that. So your triggers are the dinner, the cleaning up the kitchen, the tea, the dinner, the cleaning up the kitchen, the tea, and you keep doing it like that. That helps set yourself up for a new habit that is not the bad habit of going straight to the video games. So, you know, take that and tweak it whichever way works for you and wherever your best study place is and your best time of day to study, whatever it might be, and just keep doing it, it takes 66 days on average to form a new habit. So know that you're not going to probably feel great about this for the first couple of weeks. It's still going to be hard. But eventually, you're going to end that bad habit of playing video games before doing schoolwork. It'll be gone after around 66 days, hopefully less. <laughs>
<laughs> Jess, do you have any ideas for that? Any other suggestions? No, nothing to add. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, great. All right, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. I'll leave it open for just a moment longer um, because somebody did ask if there was a template of that assignment, uh, assignment due date uh, Excel sheet that we had. Um, and while we don't have a file for that, uh, that's going to be shared right now, um, a copy of this PowerPoint is going to be sent out. So you will be able to view that and kind of copy the format that way. Um, Oh, actually, it looks like we got two more questions uh, coming in. Um, what can you do to avoid a relapse in the pursuit of building better and new habits? So uh, mm. possibly a slip up. How can you how, how can you avoid that? Mm. I would one. say the something that's helped me. I used to have a really bad habit of biting my nails, which is mm. <laughs> Some gross habit, but um, <laughs> having an like an accountability partner, another person that can be like, "Hey, you're doing that again." <laughs> like sometimes you don't realize that you're doing those habits, right? So for me, it's taken me a really long time to break that habit. But everybody that I've lived with for the past like five years, I've asked to just, "Hey, call me out on that," like slap my hand away, <laughs> like something. Just having wow. someone like there to to help me has I've I've gotten I've broken the habit. It took me a really really long time, but having someone else in your corner is would be my advice. That is so good. That is so good. And know that everybody slips up. Mm -hmm. You're going to have you're going to have weak moments. You're going to be tired sometimes, or you know, as much as you might have good intentions, sometimes it's just your brain's not there. And that's another thing we talked about in attention management is sometimes you don't have the energy to do the hard things when it's time to do them and you have to flip things around a little bit. You might see that as, as you know, relapsing, but it may not be. It just may be learning when it's the best time for you. I think a lot of us set ourselves up for failure by expecting something of ourselves that really is is unrealistic and that might be for me I'm going to be honest if I had to make myself a cup of tea after dinner and then go study that would be really hard for me because I am a morning person and so if I told myself that's going to be my thing I'm going to struggle so what I did instead I mean I use that as my example but what I did instead was for three and a half years I got up at 4 30 every morning and actually that was easier for me I know it's crazy but and that's when I did my studying when my family was still sleeping and before I went to work. But th that is what I had to find out about myself is that I did try to study after dinner at first and I couldn't. So you just have to find what works for you, build those new habits. And yes, find someone to help you be accountable. All right, thank you so much for uh, both of you for those examples. I think they're going to be incredibly helpful for a lot of the people who uh, kind of run into the same things and same issues uh, like you mentioned. But I believe that's all the time that we have for today. So again, a follow-up email will be sent out in the near future with the PowerPoint. So you can look at the resources, look at that app list, uh, look at that uh, Excel sheet and use all of these, all this different information uh, moving forward to help kind of manage your own stress. So thank you again, Amy and Jessica for joining us today. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day.